Storyteller's Thread, a monthly podcast devoted to young adult literature and the art of storytelling. I'm your host, Sean Connors. On each episode, we invite an author for young adults to take us inside their work, and in doing so, to talk about their writing process, their inspiration for writing for young readers, and the general ins and outs of earning a living as a professional storyteller. So, whether you're a compulsive reader, an aspiring writer, a teacher or librarian, or simply a frustrated reader who's counting the hours until you get home and dive back into that novel that's waiting for you on your nightstand, this is the place for you. Hi everyone, it's May 1st. Thank you for being here, and I hope you're well and finding ways to entertain yourself during the unfortunately ongoing quarantine situation we're facing. If you've listened to this podcast before, you know it's concerned with literature for young adults. So with that in mind, a few months ago, I found myself reflecting on some of the writers who've appeared on this program, and it occurred to me that, as of that point, I hadn't talked to a single person who writes nonfiction for teenagers. I suspect you'll agree that's a fairly significant oversight, so we're going to rectify that. This month, I'm talking with the godfather of nonfiction for young adults, the critically acclaimed, multi-award winning author, Philip Hose. A native of the Hoosier State, Hose attended Indiana University and later graduated from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Sciences, after which he spent nearly four decades working for the Nature Conservancy, which is committed to protecting and preserving the plants, animals, and natural communities of the earth. In 1998, Hose published his first children's book, the picture book, Hey Little Ant, which went on to sell well over a million copies. A few years later, in 2001, his second work of nonfiction for young adults, We Were There Too, Young People in U.S. History, was named a finalist for the National Book Award. In The Race to Save the Lord Godbird, published in 2004, Hose drew on his background in conservation to chronicle the tragic story of the ivory-billed woodpecker, which was driven to extinction in the mid-20th century. In 2009, he told the story of teenage civil rights activist Claudette Colvin, whose refusal to give up her seat on a Montgomery, Alabama bus to a white rider predated Rosa Parks' decision to do the same by nearly a year. Titled Claudette Colvin, Twice Toward Justice, the book won the National Book Award for Young People's Literature and it remains the only work of nonfiction to accomplish that feat. In 2018, Hose published his most recent book for young adults, Addicts, Oscar Robinson and the Basketball Team that Awakened a City. The book examines the intersection of sports and social justice by chronicling the role that the legendary Addicts High School basketball teams played in hastening school integration in Indianapolis, Indiana. The Center for the Study of Multicultural Children's Literature named Addicts one of the best books of 2018, as did Kirkus Reviews. I spoke with Hose from his home in Portland, Maine, where he was anticipating the arrival of what he hoped would be the last snowstorm of winter. In the course of our conversation, we examined a range of topics, including Hose's motivation for writing about young activists, challenges he associates with writing nonfiction for young adults, and what he believes adults sometimes fail to understand about young people. At one point, we were even joined by an unusually exuberant cardinal, which only seemed fitting considering Hose's background in conservation. And as you'll hear, to his everlasting credit, he was able to identify the bird, sight unseen no less, from more than 2,700 miles away. You've got to admit, that's impressive. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Your educational and professional background doesn't necessarily reflect what people might expect for a writer. You graduated from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Sciences and then spent several decades working for the Nature Conservancy. What did your work there involve? I was a state director for two or three years of the state of New Hampshire. And I opened up the office and built a staff and built a board and bought land and just tried my very best, along with my colleagues, to to save what we could, to save the, the most important places uh, from the standpoint of 
natural diversity in in New Hampshire. And I also tried to uh, work with governmental agencies to put up inventories of plants and animals and uh, uh, natural communities of the states, tried to forge partnerships with governmental agencies in the states and in the Canadian provinces to, you know, erect these, these um, they were uh, inventories of, of all the plants and all the animals of, of a state or Canadian province. And uh, we together worked out uh, ways to to use the data so that we could know the most important places to try to spend money. They all had all those governmental agencies. They were operating on a shoestring. They didn't have any money. And so it was really important for them to know what the the very, very most important places were, where the rare plants and the rare animals and the best remnants of of, uh, native communities were, and then uh, to go out and, and try to help protect them. That That's pretty much what I did. I, I worked a lot in Canada, worked a lot in British Columbia uh, after the New Hampshire gig, and uh, it was fascinating work. I loved it. I, I spent 37 years with the Nature Conservancy, and I still support them, and I still think their work is just really special. How did you get started writing books? Well, the Nature Conservancy had a lot to do with that. I started on, on the staff in 1977, and the following year, they they knew I could write. I had published magazine articles and th- things like that, and so they they knew I could write. And they, the Nature Conservancy, received a an opportunity of, of uh, funds. The Island Foundation was willing to put up a year's salary, basically, of a Nature Conservancy staffer to write about saving. Uh, natural diversity, techniques that were being used, things that were working, things that were failing, just what was going on. So I spent a year because they they knew I I could write. That was why they hired me in part. And um, I traveled throughout the United States and and then in Canada interviewing people as to what they were trying and what was succeeding and what was failing in terms of, of saving the natural diversity of, of these places, of, of the state of, you know, Indiana or the, the province of uh, Ontario. And I published it in a book. It was a funny experience because that first book, which I was writing in 1979, it was before personal computers were in. Uh, nobody had computers. And so I had to write it out in longhand on a, a yellow legal pad. And a woman named Lynn, <laughs> Lynn Lilly, I remember her name, had to transcribe the whole thing, type the whole thing out. And then it came out, I think that book came out in 1980. And it was it was cool because not only had I, you know, succeeded in the assignment that they gave me, they were very happy with what I did, but I was now published. I was now the, the published author of a, of a book. And that helped me a lot later on in my career just to get a start that way. As people who are familiar with your work know, you write predominantly nonfiction. To what do you attribute your interest in nonfiction? What is it about that genre that appeals to you as a writer? When I was a kid, meaning, you know, 15, 16 years old, I started reading the work of Tom Wolfe, The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. And uh, and I just loved how he could do that, how he could put himself in a room and and just scope the room out, scope the people, the personalities, what motivated them, what was their hidden agenda, you know, uh, just to describe them. I, I, I thought he was a genius, and I kind of wanted to be like him. He was one of my early literary influences, uh, I'd say. So, you know, that that's one thing. And I, just, I love nonfiction. I think it's, it's, it's hard to do. It's fun. It's a real challenge to tell a story that has to be true. I mean, that's, that's the game. And to, uh, and to do it well. I'm thinking about your comments about Tom Wolfe's work. You've said that a work of nonfiction is good when the person inside the story is allowed to come out. I wonder if you could say more about how you mean that. I, I just think that, you know, um, a, a story like The Race to Save the Lord Godbert 
so forth. It, it's a challenge to uh, bring uh, a, a person like James Tanner, for example, to to a reader when a James Tanner is dead. B uh, he didn't publish much, so you really have to go digging. I, I got a lot of information from Cornell, their laboratory, and you know it's just it's just a real challenge to piece together a story that's interesting to take characters that aren't really flamboyant people. You know, James Tanner was anything but flamboyant. He was pretty shy. A lot of the people that I've written about are introverts. And, uh, you know, to to bring the person out, to bring the passion that he felt, he was, he may have been an introvert. He, he didn't talk much, but he was, he felt things very, very deeply. And uh, he felt almost personally the loss of the ivory bill woodpecker it became almost like a, a kid you know to him having not spent a lot of time with nonfiction, I, I enjoy the nonfiction i read but i read fiction far more and i found myself curious as a writer how do you approach revealing the personalities of the people that you are writing about because as you're saying in like james tanner's case he isn't available to talk to how do you approach that problem of, of bringing out their personalities? Well, sometimes I'm more successful than others, and a lot of it has to do with the resources that are available. In uh, the case, going back once again to the race to save the Lord God bird, I was lucky that Tanner's widow was still alive. She died at the age of 96 or 97, and she was Gabby. You know, she, she was a real chatterbox, and she loved to tell those stories. So here was a, a, a first-person resource, source, and that, that was terrific. And I've been lucky, and uh, in others, Claudette Colvin was uh, not only alive, but she was more than willing to tell her story, especially at that point. So, it, it, you know, if you, if you have the ability to, the opportunity to really interview people, either the the people that you're writing about or, or someone once removed, a spouse or, you know, a parent or, or a child. That's what I like. I, I prefer, you know, first-person research. If I can get a, an interview, I'll do it uh, at the drop of a hat. You mentioned that most of the people you've talked to are introverts. Is it difficult to get them to open up about these sort of intimate aspects of their lives? Yeah, it, it, well, it just varies with with Claudette, for example, Claudette Colvin, she was uh, alive, and you know it took me four years to persuade her to talk with me. I approached her twice a year. I'd put a tickle date on a calendar, and twice a year I would ask uh, this newspaper reporter for USA Today, who knew us both. I'd ask the reporter, "Would would you try again? Ask her again if she'll talk with me, if she'll work with me." And, you know, I didn't think it was going to work out. I wasn't going to quit, and I had another book that I was writing, so it wasn't like I had dropped what I was doing to to do this, to, to be with Claudette. But uh, the way it worked out, I, I was coming home one night and uh, opened the door, and the blinking red light on my telephone was there, meaning I had a message, and it was the newspaper reporter saying, uh, Claudette has agreed to talk with you. Here's her telephone number. You know, good luck. And and that was it. I didn't sleep the whole night. I just scribbled questions. And about 10.30 the next morning, uh, I called that number, and a woman answered, and it was indeed Claudette Colvin. We got along. I asked her if I could visit her in New York. She said yes, and we made a date. I wasn't 100% sure that she would show up. <laughs> I just didn't know, but she did. And uh, we spent the whole day together, and and uh, decided we'd we'd throw in together, that we'd work together and try to make this happen. But uh, Claudette was like a lot of people I've talked to. In that at, at the beginning, she was wary, uh, didn't know for sure, you know, who I was or whether she wanted to talk with me or give anything away. Or, but as as the day went went on, we we found a way. You know, if I have a gift, I guess it's maybe that that I can find a way to make someone express themselves pretty candidly, and uh, it's, it's worked out well. 
You began, as you mentioned, you began your career writing books for adults, but later turned your focus to writing for children and teenagers. What inspired you to make that transition? My daughter, Hannah, who is now 36 and a first grade teacher, when she was a kindergartner, she did a remarkable thing, I thought. She proposed, and she was like six years old when she did this, she proposed to her, her teacher that they auction the art off that they accumulated in a year. I mean, most of the time, grade school kids, you know, draw and paint and, you know, keep their stuff and then they throw them away. But Hannah saw some value in them and she asked the teacher, if, rather than throwing the art away, they sell it in an auction. And uh, they the school did that and they made, you know, six or seven hundred bucks and took it to the Preble Street Resource Center, which is a homeless shelter here in Portland, Maine. And it just got me thinking, boy, you don't hear about stuff like that very much, but there must be dozens and maybe hundreds of stories of young activists or young people helping others. So I decided I'd, I'd try it. I'd try to, you know, find such people and interview them and write their stories as a way as a, a searchlight, really, for other kids, you know, who could read them. And so I, I got a contract with Little Brown and wrote a book called It's Our World Too. And it was, I think, 14 or 15 stories based on extensive interviews in every case about what they had done, why they, they did it, sort of like this conversation right now. You know, why did they do it? How did they get the idea? But, yeah, I... I loved it. I, I thought it was terrific. And the, the book did well. It was really well reviewed. And on I went. I came across an interview you gave in which you recalled a conversation you had with a young activist, um, a 13 year old girl from South Bend, Indiana, named Sarah Rosen. Sarah Rosen. Yep. You described that your conversation with her as having deeply impacted you. And I was wondering, would you mind sharing that story? Yeah, um, one of the 14 or 15 people that I interviewed for It's Our World Too was, uh, I think she was in about 8th grade, 8th grade, ninth grade. Her name was Sarah Rosen. She was from South Bend, Indiana. And uh, she went to school and her, her principal addressed the entire student body saying that they were going to stage a reenactment of the Constitutional Convention of and one thing that he wanted to make it clear about was that it was for boys only. There would be no girls in this in this performance. And Sarah just burned, you know, with, with anger, but, you know, raised her hand and said, why not? And the principal said, because there were no girls, there were no women in the Constitutional Convention, there will be no girls uh, here in our school to do this. And Sarah contained her anger, organized her class, her classmates found a, a teacher to help. And on the day that the official reenactment took place, Sarah had already called the South Bend Tribune uh, newspaper. She called radio stations and television stations. And at that moment, they all descended and they filmed and they covered the counter convention and the, the plucky kid who led it, you know, and that's how I found out about her. There was a little article about her in Ms. Magazine, which somebody sent me. And uh, I found her phone number and called her, spoke with her parents, got permission to talk with her. And so I, I kind of got to know her. That was one of the best things about these books with groups of, of young activists. They were just such a pleasure to know, and it was fascinating to talk with them. I was talking with Sarah one evening on, on the telephone, and she she just blurted out. She says, you know, it isn't just a problem with girls not getting opportunities. I said, what do you mean? She said, the real problem that I feel is there are no people our age in U.S. history books. So you never, you, all you do is, is read about, you know, stuffy white generals and magnates and people like that. And it, it makes me feel awful. I said, well, what do you mean? How does it make you feel awful? She said, it makes me feel invisible. Like I, I'm not part of history and I won't be eligible. I won't have enough weight or body mass or something to to count, to, to even register in history. Well, I said, first of all, that can't be true, Sarah. There has to be uh, 
more than that, you know. And she said, well, go go find a middle school history book and look at it and then tell me what you see, you know. So I did. I had a friend who was a, who was a middle school teacher. She loaned me her book for a, a while, and I read it, and Sarah was right. There, there were only two teenagers in all of the, the massive history book that I, I read. One was Pocahontas. The other was Sacagawea. They were both teenaged uh, Native American girls who guided whites into freshly explored, unexplored territory. And the only reason they made history books at all was because Lewis and Clark and John Smith kept journals, kept diaries, and they were characters in the journals. So I called Sarah back a few days later, and I said, you're right, you're right. And uh, she just kept bringing this point up. I don't feel real. I don't feel represented. And so I spent the next six years writing a book called We Were There Too, Young People in U.S. History. It's 66 stories, all nonfiction, of kids who were involved in history. Either they were there or they were change agents. But at last, you know, they kind of had their, their day in the sun. And the book was nominated for the National Book Award. didn't win, but it was, was nominated. And then it, I don't know how much of a difference it's made, really. I, I know that, you know, you go to schools and there's one copy of that book, We Were There Too. And I, I wish there were more. Right now it's it's presented as this sort of beautiful coffee table book, and that's not what I want. I, I'd rather have several volumes and as much online as, as we could possibly get. The books you've written cover a range of topics, from conservation to sports to history, but with relatively few exceptions, young people are at the center of them. Talking about your work at the 2010 National Book Festival, you said that, I'm going to quote you here, as a writer, you aspire to bring the hope and righteousness of youth into the national story. Can you say more about that mission and why that's so important to you? Well, it's just the way young people are. They're righteous. They're, they know what's right and wrong, and they're, they're, serious. they're serious about it. They're fearless. They're not going to stop for you because they know that they're right. And uh, I think, you know, that's a, a real asset to have with Greta. You know, she, she is absolutely confident. She's absolutely sure of herself and the, and the rightness of the cause that she has. And I ran up against a lot of people her age who had that same feeling of righteousness. They're not going to let anybody get in the way of, of what they know is is right. And of course, sometimes it, it turns out not to have been right, or their, you know, their confidence was was misplaced. But not so often, and it's wonderful to to feel that way, to have those feelings, to find other people your age who feel those feelings, and to have the technology, to master the technology, to be so easy and fluent with technology, to make it uh, to make it a powerful weapon, a powerful tool of of your work. You've said that you believe, although in our culture we, we regard young people through a deficit model as being more apathetic about institutional politics or about being ill-informed about current affairs, you've said in the past that you think young people are probably better suited in some ways to advocate for social and political issues than maybe adults are. Well, I, I think that that's true. You know, you look at the, the, the shooting in Florida, and the, there were several really powerful advocates that arose, youth advocates, kids, you know, who arose from that horrible tragedy. And, you know, and it's one thing to have an adult, a principal or a teacher, tell you, remark to you that, uh, you know, this is how it happened and this is how it went down. But it's it's quite different to have a student, a classmate of a victim talk to you and uh you you have to listen i think in a in a in a stronger way than than if a, if a principal or a teacher an adult tells you this i wish we had the whole day to talk about each one of your books in depth because the people and the topics that you've written about are really fascinating to me but since we can't do that what i thought i'd do is ask you to talk about some of the young activists that you've written about you mentioned her a bit earlier, but let's start with the namesake of your book, Claudette Colvin, Twice Toward Justice, which 
you published in 2009, I think, and which won the National Book Award for Young People's Literature. Right, and still the only work of nonfiction to ever won it. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. What can you tell us about Claudette Colvin for people who aren't familiar with her? Well, I mean, what made her reach my attention anyway is uh, when I was writing We Were There Too, the, the history book, I was looking for, it's chronological. It starts with, with Columbus and the Tainos and so forth and, and barrels through uh, the Mayflower and, and uh, the expansion of the West and so forth. And I got to the Civil Rights Movement and it just leaped out at you how present and how active and how heroic and how just important kids were to the Civil Rights Movement. You know, the whole Civil Rights Movement really started with an episode about kids, which is Brown versus the Board of Education. It said that students had to study together in public schools, regardless of their race. And that's all about kids. You know, it's not adults who are, who are going into those schoolhouses in, in Little Rock or, you know, places like that. Uh, it, it was kids. They were the ones that took the hit. You know, they were the heroes of it. And as I was, you know, doing the research for the civil rights section of We Were There Too, it hit me that there wasn't a voice. There wasn't a, a personality. And I decided that I'd like to write about one person, one teenage, you know, boy or girl who was, who was really important and uh, came across Claudette Colvin. I don't even know how I, I did this or how I found her. But I found her and I thought, boy, she would be perfect because she did something that was really, really important. You know, she was the one who, you know, almost a year before Rosa Parks got famous for refusing to surrender her public bus seat to a, a white patron. Claudette did that, you know, a year before. And uh, I kept thinking, boy, if I could find her, what a story she has to tell. And, and uh, you never know what somebody's going to be like. I was hoping that I could find someone I could write a book about, uh, uh, an African-American teen from the civil rights movement. And uh, as I've said, it took me you know, four years to find her and to start working with her. But once I did, she, had, she, she was everything that I... I wanted, you know, in, in uh, an informant, she was able to understand history, both personally and kind of institutionally. She could tell you what something meant, and she could also tell you how it felt. And that's, that's gosh, that's what you really want in an informant. If you're writing nonfiction, that's what you're looking for. And she, she was wonderful. We, I went to New York. She lived in the Bronx at the time, and I, I visited her Oh, a bunch of times, and then we had a lot of telephone interviews, and um, finally, you know, the book came out in 2009, I believe it was, and did really, really well, which which tickled her. You know, she she's like, you know, like anybody else, she wants recognition for, for you know, what she'd done, for the courage that she'd exerted, and it was, it was you know, the award that it got really helped. Now I think it's it's getting pretty hard to talk about Rosa Parks and about the Montgomery bus boycott without talking about Claudette Colvin and her courage. A moment ago, you said that Claudette was a rich informant in part because of her ability to recall her story and explain not only what things meant, but also how they felt. Why is that affective piece important to you as a writer of nonfiction? Well, because my readers are going to be, by and large, the same age or around the same age that Claudette was when she made these things happen in the uh, mid-50s. She was 15 years old when she was arrested and 16 years old when she testified in Browder versus Gale in the federal lawsuit. And, uh, you know, that's interesting. It's fascinating and you admire her bravery, but you don't really respond to her the way you do when she says, you know, when she got back to school the Monday morning after her um, bus stand and she was sprung from jail, word had gotten around the school, and some of the students rejected her. They made fun of her. They held their noses and said, it's my constitutional right, my constitutional right, which is what she had said to the bus driver and the police officers who dragged her off the bus. 
how her boyfriend was toward her, how alone she felt at a certain point. It just makes everything so much richer that I was I was thrilled when, you know, she could respond to my questions about how she felt about things. I teach your book, and I recommend your book to other educators, but I continue to find most people have not heard of Miss Colvin, and that was the case for me prior to you reading your book. Why do you think she's received so little attention in history prior to this point? Well, she wasn't exactly, you know, showcased in her day, you know, in the 1955, 1956. The adult leaders in the community in Montgomery, Alabama, were they were tough-minded and they, they knew what they wanted. They, they were willing to let her go so far. She wasn't the first person ever to refuse to uh, surrender her seat. There had been a few over the years before Claudette, but they had uh, all kind of paid their fine and gone home and felt bad. Claudette wanted a lawyer, and they, they went far enough so that they gave her a lawyer, and the lawyer was a good lawyer, Fred Gray, and he tried hard, but the odds were stacked against him, and, and they didn't win. And then they kind of ditched her. They, they walked away from her until they needed her again with a, a, a federal lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of the bus laws, and uh, they couldn't find anybody brave enough to, you know, be the plaintiff, to, to tack their name on the, on the legal papers. Such a person would be in grave danger and put her family in danger, put her neighbors in danger of death, you know. But she did it. She did it. She really, really had got, and they won. They won that, that lawsuit, that federal lawsuit. But you, you ask, you know, why, why have you not heard of Claudette Colvin? Some part of it has to do with, with Claudette's just personality. She's not one who's going to go running in the middle of the street saying, pay attention to me. I did this. Hey, you're leaving me out. And sometimes, you know, it takes some self-promotion to, to be noticed. So there's, there's a little bit of that, I think, but. Oh, I mean, the, the difference between now and, and 10 years ago uh, is, is just tremendous. I don't think you can, uh, as I said before, I don't think you can write a history of the civil rights movement, especially the early part, without dealing with Claudette now. And that wasn't the case when, when that book came out. No, in reading your book, you do get the impression that she was sort of... Um, shelved by the adults, in part due to her age, in part due to the fact that she was a teenager at the time. And I think that's really striking, especially when you consider that the Supreme Court case that she was part of, Browder v. Gale, the, the people who did show the courage to sign on to that, I think they were all young women. Is that correct? No, not quite. And it started with five women. Uh, one of whom was 77, Susie McDonald. But there were there were five that they started with, and one dropped out because they threatened to take her husband's job. So that brought the total down to four plaintiffs. They were all women. One was 19. Her last name was Smith. And then Claudette, who was, by that time, she was 16. Although Claudette is known today for having refused to give up her seat to a white rider on a Montgomery bus, that wasn't her most significant contribution to history. As you argue in your book, far more impactful was her involvement in the Browderverse Gale lawsuit. Is that correct? Well, I don't know how to rank them or to compare them. You know, they were both very, very courageous things to do and, and high risk things to do, too, because in both instances, her name got in the paper, and she, you know, exposed herself and her neighbors and her family to retribution the night that she was arrested and, and then later on was released and sprung. The whole neighborhood stayed up armed all night waiting for the, the clan to come up the hill. They, they, their neighborhood was perched on a little hill called King's Hill, and the, many of the men in the neighborhood stayed up with guns waiting to be attacked. So it was, there was real danger there. And as far as the impact of Browder versus Gale versus her, her bus stand, it'd be a hard thing to compare because 
her refusal to surrender her bus seat to a white passenger, something that had happened before, but she was the first one who ever took it on, whoever got a lawyer and went to court and really tried to change it. The others didn't. So that made it pretty important. As for Browder versus Gale, though, it was really important because the Montgomery bus boycott was stalling. You know, you never really read this in any books about the civil rights movement and so forth, but it was not really working out all that well at that time. They were sort of stalemated, and the lawyers involved in the NAACP could see that something else had to happen, that they needed to, you know, reinforce the the impact of the bus boycott itself because the bus company wasn't giving in and the city wasn't giving in, and the way they saw it, the whole Southern way of life was at stake. So, yeah, there were really two things she did that were brave. First, she agreed to be identified as a plaintiff on the lawsuit, which, once again, puts your name in the paper, puts you and your your neighbors and, and your friends at great vulnerability. But she did it. And then the other thing was testifying strongly, as she did in the hearing itself. Very, very courageous thing to do. And I think it had a, it really did end the need for the, Montgomery bus boycott because it was now illegal to segregate passengers by race. So it, it was both those episodes were incredibly important and showed great courage on her part. Let's talk about another one of the people you've written about. In 2015, you published The Boys Who Challenged Hitler, which tells the story of Knud Peterson and the Churchill Club. Would you mind sharing Knud's story for people who aren't familiar with him? Yeah, in Denmark, in World War II, there just came a time when uh, Hitler was ready to uh, take over and and use Denmark. The German army was, you know, vastly superior to the local Danish army. They were barely defended, Denmark. And anyway, one day it just happened. Uh, Here came all the airplanes dropping leaflets saying, you're now a protectorate of Germany. Congratulations. You're going to love this. Uh, and it took probably, you know, 12 to 14 hours for the government to give up and to, you know, just be that house dog. Um, there was uh, a, a group of, of boys, two of them that were brothers, uh, Jens Peterson and, and Knud Peterson, who resented this and they, they just weren't going to take it. And they organized a cell to oppose and resist and foul up the German army that had come to occupy them. And uh, they didn't know what to do at first. They, they'd never done anything like this before. Uh, it took them a while to gain the courage to, to do really significant acts, blowing trains up and things like that. But they did. And the Germans were furious. And they insisted that the Danish police find whoever was doing this and bring them to the Germans. And, uh, it took uh, another half year or so, but they did. They they caught them all and jailed them all, and some of them escaped from jail. It was, it's just an incredible story. And they they really gave the adults the courage to, to resist. That was what they are famous for. They were the first uh, resistors, and when they were arrested and jailed, they awakened the conscience of the of the country. They they emboldened their adult leaders. How did the opportunity to tell that story, to tell Knud's story, come about? I was on a bicycle trip in Denmark, and uh, the day before we were to fly back home to the United States, I visited a war resistors museum in Copenhagen. It's since been burned to the ground. And uh, over in the corner of, of the main room was an exhibit of the Churchill Club and showed these kids. Some of them had prison numbers on them and, you know, they, they looked to be about 15 or 16 years old and that was great for me. You know the kind of books I write. It, it just really stirred me. So I asked the curator if any of these people were still alive and he gave me Peterson's contact numbers and when I got back to the States, I called him and he said, uh, I can't work with you. I've already sold my rights to the story to Disney so, Mr. Hose, I appreciate it if you'd not foul the waters. Thanks for your interest. Goodbye. Well, I wrote him back and said, good luck. I'll look forward to the Disney movie, you know, and uh, didn't contact him again for another decade. 
and I was between books, and I was piecing through files, old manila files, just trying to get an idea for the next book. And here was a skinny little file with two pieces of paper in it, I think. It said Denmark. And I opened it, and there was the correspondence. It wasn't a telephone call. It was an email correspondence with uh, Knud Peterson. And there was a telephone number, and there was an email address. I I think I wrote him, and it was an email. And uh, I just, are you alive? <laughs> you know, are you <laughs> Uh, uh, available, you know, and, and uh, within uh, a few hours, he wrote back and said, uh, Disney deal fell through. I'm eligible to to work with you. When will you be in Copenhagen? And I uh, I wrote to him and said, I, I can be there between, you know, June 7th and June 14th. He wrote back and said, I'll pick you up at the airport. I got on a plane. Flew out there and spent the whole week um, interviewing Knud Peterson, and uh, so that that's how it happened. And your most recent book, which you published in 2018, Attics, sees you return to your native state of Indiana. Uh, would you mind giving listeners who aren't familiar with that book a sense of what it's about? As long as we talk about "Hey Little Ant." Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I I grew up in Indiana and was really aware of love for basketball, the, the mania for high school basketball that still exists in Indiana. It's just amazing how it's, it's hung on. But Indiana, the state of Indiana in the 20s was the Klan state. There was a any way you cut it, per capita, just hundreds of thousands of white men and women uh, were suckered into thinking that uh, we were the best, we, you know, we were the cream of the world and that, that others were coming to get us and we had to stand tall against this. The Catholics were coming to take our jobs, but by working for cheaper, blacks were just unacceptable for all sorts of reasons for them. And so in the, in the 20s, all sorts of things happened. You know, the, the electorate just changed tremendously. All sorts of local judges and school board officials all throughout the towns and cities of Indiana went over to this, this Ku Klux Klan way of thinking. And then the Ku Klux Klan came roaring through Indiana. A guy named D.C. Stevenson was the Grand Dragon and he was a, a brilliant speaker. He could, he could get poorly educated people to uh, believe that um, their lives and jobs were in danger and that we you know, they had to do something. And anyway, among the things that happened in Indianapolis was that the school board in 1922 put up the money to build a school for blacks, a high school for blacks. And uh, they named it Crispus Attucks High School after the first person to die in the Revolutionary War who was African-American and has become a, a, a hero. And uh, the school didn't open until 1927, but every black kid in Indianapolis of school age had to go to Christmas Attics High. And they lived in just hovels, just just, just shacks uh, near the White River. The black population just really had it, had it bad. It was really uh, a terrible time for them. And they hung together in their neighborhoods, and the, the school was a great school. They had the pick of the, the, the crop of great teachers in, in colleges who couldn't get jobs and uh, went to Indianapolis and taught at Attic. There were teachers there who could speak six or seven languages. One of the early things they wanted to do was register for the basketball tournament, and uh, they were rebuffed. They were told that because Christmas Attic's high school was not a public school, they couldn't play in the public you know, basketball tournament. What you got there, a uh, cardinal? Yeah, it is. You can hear him. <laughs> yeah. He hangs out around here, yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, it turns into a basketball story after that. They uh, ended up winning the state tournament, beating out 700 and some other schools, and they were led by members of the Robertson family, Oscar, Henry, and Flap, they called them. And uh, Oscar Robertson turned out to be one of the greatest basketball players that ever lived, and he he totally took over the tournament. 
and it's it's the story of how a community banded together and shook off horrible prejudice through through basketball by becoming the first Indianapolis school to win the state tournament after 44 years, and um, they they caused people to kind of rethink African Americans. I mean, they they had done Indianapolis a, a tremendous favor. And uh, how how were we to feel? Were we to feel grateful to them, or were we still so racially prejudiced that there's nothing they could do to make things any better for themselves? And you make a really interesting case in the book in speculating that the success of those teams and the coaches and players may have actually facilitated or hastened integration of schools in in Indianapolis. Is that right? Yeah, I think it, I think it is right. I mean, they for a, a long while they didn't, you know, bother by they. I mean, the, the school officials in in Indiana didn't didn't bother much with uh, African Americans. But when a team consisting entirely of of blacks started winning and won two years in a row, there were a bunch of educators, if you want to call them that, who said enough is enough. They'll, there'll be a dynasty here. They'll win every year. We can't let that happen. So they then changed the uh, the rules and made it a more neighborhood-based situation and, and loosened up the uh, rules by which uh, blacks could go to different schools, Indianapolis Short Ridge or Manual or Tech, Broad Ripple. Suddenly hundreds of kids, but the pioneers were the basketball players. That's who they wanted. A moment ago, you brought up your children's picture book, Hey Little Ant, and while I wasn't prepared to talk about it with you, it's occurring to me now that, in fact, thematically, the book connects to the conversation we're having very well. But before I get to that, was there something that you wanted to say about the book? Well, first of all, it's by far the most successful enterprise I've ever ever done. It's sold well over a million copies and uh, is in 10 languages. It got got awards and terrific reviews, and it's it's used as a kind of a character tool or a, a tool for treating animals well. Or they've used it for everything, but somehow it isn't known commercially. It's made its uh, its way through school systems, and uh, it was something my my family and I we had a family band with a bunch of musicians, and uh, my daughter. Hannah was, I guess, nine when we when we started singing it. It's a dialogue between an ant about to get squished and the child about to squish it, and the the ant is given a voice, and they they have a debate about this, and it, and it ends it ends up with the final verse, which Hannah and I often perform together. Should the ant get squished? Should the ant go free? It's up to the kid, not up to me. We'll leave the kid with a raised up shoe. What do you think that kid should do? And so we leave it. That's the power of the story is, is it's left open like that. So um, as I say, it, it's by far the most successful thing I've ever done. And I think it really fits nicely into our conversation and that the book is in many ways making an argument for empathy and for understanding. And that theme certainly spans the nonfiction that we've been talking about this morning as well. You know, I'm curious, Phil, when you reflect on your career, having had the opportunity to travel around the country, the world, and talk with young people, what do you want adults to know about them that they might not otherwise understand or appreciate? Well, I think how serious they are, how how they, they really mean this when they say it, it's our world to inherit we're we're going to be the ones who are hanging around while you guys are long dead. They mean it, and and it's true. You know, I tell you that the thing I sometimes feel guilty about, not just me, but but I think a, a lot of people in in our generation is that we leave this this false impression that it's up to the kids to save the world. You know, I write all these these chapters of, of with role models and role models in history and other people do the same and and it's it's good i mean it's good that they're inspired it's it's good that they're animated and activated and so forth but it's sort of a bum deal 
it's pretty easy for adults to say, well, you know, good luck and uh, let us know how you're doing, <laughs> you know. I, I think, you know, this this is a biological community that we have here, and we're all going to have to work together. It isn't any one generation or any one group's job. It's everybody's job, and it's becoming a harder and harder job. I, I think this this outbreak is, you know, is just biology. It's just, you know, you you read about how the how the thing started, you know, with bat droppings and I don't know. I, I it gets it, it it really I I wish I could do more. Are there young people today whose involvement in activist causes you'd be interested in writing about if the opportunity presented itself? I I think that I'm gonna take a breather from <laughs> from uh, kid activism. I'm I've got another bird book uh cooking. So I, I don't think that I'm gonna I, I think I'm gonna finish this this book. Yeah. Are you able to give people a sense of what it is you're working on or or, or the focus of the book? A bird. A bird? I have to tell you, Phil, that's just ambiguous enough to be intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well we'll leave it at that. Hey, listen, I really appreciate your taking time to talk with me. Pleasure to talk with you too, Sean. And that's a wrap for this month's installment of the Storyteller's Thread. Thank you for tuning in, and thank you to Philip Hose for making time to talk with us about his work. If you know a young reader who enjoys nonfiction, or if you'd like to learn more about Claudette Colvin or one of the other people we talked about today, do yourself a favor and check Phil's books out. You won't go wrong, I promise. I'll see you back here next month, when we'll continue to talk about the craft of storytelling for young adults. Till then, be well, and happy reading. <laughs>